Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of the Business as Usual podcast uh, with me and Mike. Um, we had a little bit of a break because of half term. Um, Mike went on a last, last, uh, <laughs> what was it, a late holiday? It wasn't Thomas Cook, obviously. Uh, last minute booking. Yeah. Where'd you go? Uh, Turkey. Hey, very nice. Um, so we didn't record anything last week, first week back. Um, although, depending on where you are in the country, you might actually be on half term now because I think a lot of places are on half term this week instead. Um, so we've got quite a few news stories to um, have a look at. We're going to look at five in particular. Um, I want to I want to give an example of advertising first, though, because advertising comes in one of the biggest topics in business, probably one of the most engaging topics in business as well, is advertising. And advertising comes in many forms. And one such form is sponsorship. Now, we aren't at the stage for the Business as Usual podcast where we could get a sponsor, but <laughs> long term, maybe we will be able to. And I just want to shout out a place that I went to yesterday called Pizza Town. Pizza Town is based in Bury St. Edmunds in Suffolk, and they basically sell you for 50 quid a 28-inch pizza. Um, so you get 28-inch pizza and six drinks for 50 quid. And the pizza is like, it's massive. Like, it takes up the entire table. You have to go in a team of four, um, and it's like a full team effort to, to eat it. Um, and we did some maths while we were having this pizza. It's really good value. You pay like £12.50 each between the four of you, and you get good. You get really, really good value. And... Um, to prove the value, I did some calculations and I worked out that that pizza, the 28-inch pizza that I had, and there's probably similar things available elsewhere, um, but if you're anywhere near Bury St. Edmunds, make a trip. If you're in sort of Hertfordshire, um, Suffolk, Norfolk, or Essex, you might be able to make a trip there. It's worth, it's the, in terms of surface area, the 28-inch pizza is equivalent to just about five dominoes, five large dominoes. Um, so... The business—it's not. We're not paid to do this, but I just want to—I just want to show you what it could. I thought we turned like. to a maths podcast for a minute there. No, no. <laughs> I just want to show you what it would be like if we were to be sponsored. So today's business as usual podcast is not quite sponsored, but kind of sponsored <laughs> by Pizza Town in Barry St Edmunds. If you want a massive pizza that you need four people to eat, Pizza Town is the place to go. Just you never know that might that might come back in a few months' time, and we might end up with a sponsor or something like that. We've already been offered a TV show, haven't we? Um, oh, that was a great plug. Oh yeah, that yeah. was strange. That was that TV show yeah. email. We've got we got an email last weekend from some guy from this business leaders United Television thing saying that um, he's come across our YouTube channel and is putting together a TV show that's going to be on Apple TV and Amazon Fire and was asking if we maybe fancied our own show. So you might find that we hit the big time. It's probably one of those things where they ask for you like credit card details and your mum's maiden name. Um, but who knows? I'm going to email the guy. I haven't emailed him yet. I'm playing it a little bit cool. You know, he's asked us if we want to have a TV show. I'm going to play it a little bit cool before we before we um, send him an email back saying, yeah, definitely. Even if we just do one, just to say that we had a TV show would be pretty cool. Um, so... Without further ado, let's get started on uh, the first story we've got, which is Apple. So we'll all be familiar with Apple. Um, most students, I would expect, have some sort of Apple merchandise. It's one of the biggest brands, one of the most popular brands in, in sort of that under 20 market. Um, they've reported an increase in their, uh, it's an actually a record high quarter four earnings this week. And the big thing that they're saying with this, the big thing that's caused this increase in their revenue and their profit is not the iPhone. It's actually all their wearables and other services that they're trying to they're trying to sort of promote. Effectively, Apple obviously really really successful and it's been incredibly successful for a long time. But but that's really kicked on since the launch of the iPhone in two thousand and seven. The problem with that is when a company becomes too reliant on one product, it puts them in a bit like it's you know that phrase putting your eggs in one basket. Well, they kind of did that a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was about 2014, uh, they estimated that about 70, above 70% 70 of the revenue that came in for Apple came from the iPhone series. Now, the problem is, is if trends change or technology changes and people don't use smartphones anymore, I don't know what would have to happen for that to be the case, but it could happen. Um, you look at Nokia as a really good example of a business that thought that they had a pretty secure hand on the market and then things just changed because of technology and they didn't adapt. Apple have to diversify and they've diversified. I'll explain a little bit more about what diversification means in a minute, but I just want to first sort of say how they've done that. So 2015, they recognized that they had to do this. They started branching out a little bit 
with, with different types of iPads. So the iPad mini targeted more towards younger people, the iPad Pro targeted more towards professionals, and things like the Apple Watch. Um, recently, the AirPods have become massive. I know they're just about to launch the second generation of, I, of AirPods, but I know that everyone's got those, especially I mean, half my sixth one probably has them. Um, and they've also announced Apple TV, their, uh, the streaming service that you might be able to see us on soon. Um, so they've done a lot to diversify, to basically not just rely on the iPhone for their success. And that's what they're saying is, is having the biggest impact. So I'll quote something that Tim Cook said. So Tim Cook is their chief executive. He said, uh, although the iPhone 11 models were off to a very, very good start, he said that sales for AirPods, Apple Watches, and streaming services continue to rise. His quote is, it was an incredible year. It is an incredible quarter for wearables. It was a very broad range of services that set new all-time records from our payment services to the search ad business, to Apple Music, Apple Care, the App Store and cloud services, almost every kind of service that they're in. So this, this is something that they've been trying to do for a while. They're trying to reduce the dependency on the iPhone. That being said, the iPhone still generated about $33.3 billion in, in sales. Their overall quarterly um, revenue was $64 billion. So it was still more than half, but, but about 20% less than it was in the past. And this has had a big impact on their, their share price. Their share prices have gone up by about 2.5% since sort of that figure was announced. They've focused on a few things. Uh, the, credit, the Apple Card credit card, they've got the streaming service, the uh, Apple Watch, the AirPods, the streaming service is obviously um, set to launch today. And that's going to be a competitor to Netflix, Amazon, Disney, etc. They've also done quite a bit to focus on health as well. So the Apple Watch, one of the big sort of social trends is people, are care, people care a bit more about their health now. Um, one of the big trends that they've tried to, to try to sort of meet this is through their Apple watch so having sort of um cycle tracking activity trends and um electrocardiogram services all coming through their watch as well um it's obviously had a big big impact i want to talk a little bit about diversification though so one common model that you'd find in usually in year 13 in, in business studies is ansoft's matrix so i know that my students have just studied ansoft's matrix the last few weeks and the idea behind ansoft's matrix is that a business makes any kind of action really and it will affect either new products being launched or existing products being adapted potentially or just or just marketing a bit more and then current markets that they're, they're already operating in or new markets that they're potentially going into so there's loads of examples for of this for apple it's probably the probably the best example because they hit all four boxes so the first thing is you've got your market penetration which is any example of an offer that they might put on one of their products would be an example of market penetration. Um, any advertising campaigns to advertise products that are already out would count as market penetration. They've also got product development, so where they launch a new product into a current market. So this happens, we're seeing this with the AirPods Generation 2, the iPhone 11, the new Apple Watch. Those are just examples of products that are still being targeted at the same consumers, but a newer version of it, taking advantage of changes in technology or just taking advantage of the fact that people want new tech every six months. They've got their market development. Anytime they take something to a new country. So I remember the first time that they launched the iPhone in China, that was a big, big market for them. So an example of market development. And then the one we're talking about now is, is diversification. So that's where you take a completely new product into a completely new market. And streaming is the, is the big example for now, but the first time they launched the AirPods, the first time they launched the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, all of these different things, are examples of diversification. Really high risk because it's not something they've got any experience of before, but really high reward. And Apple is starting to see sort of the benefit of that reward now. Yeah, I mean, um, Apple Apple have needed to, to di uh, diversify. Um, but I mean, I don't think they have need it as much as they will do in, in the future. I think it is more planning for the future because the Chinese um, manufacturers haven't really hit them on the iPhone as much as they will do in the future, I imagine. Um, so it's an interesting one, something they need to do. Um, right, moving on to uh, the next story. We've got the biggest um, probably merger going um, over the next few months with the Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot merger um, that's been mooted. Uh, so about 10 years ago, Fiat, a huge Italian car manufacturer, um, with a good foothold in, in Europe, uh, merge with Chrysler, um, which is a big a big American uh, manufacturer. And that was about 10 years ago that was successful. 
And now the Fiat Chrysler partnership are looking um, to merge with Peugeot, who are a, a big French uh, manufacturer. Um, they're hoping to be able to come together to be more competitive in, in the very tricky um, environment that, that car manufacturers are, are operating in. Um, and they're hoping to be able to better, better innovate, um, reduce costs, come up with new models, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they have very distinctive capabilities, um, according to the news article I read, um, which they would look to um, take advantage of together. Um, in the short term, they're looking to be able to better access each other's markets as well, because even though Fiat um, had a presence in Europe, um, it's not not anywhere near as big as Peugeot's. Um, so so uh, Fiat Chrysler are looking to take advantage of the European market more, um, where they have a, just a small presence. Um, and Peugeot, who have zero presence in, in the US markets, are looking to uh, reciprocate there and go into their markets. Um, and then in the long term, um, it finishes off by saying that they're hoping that, you know, to, to uh, put their heads together uh, to try and crack that Chinese market. Because up to now, they've both seen that as too big a, a challenge to take on um, alone. So they're hoping to, to bring pull the resources together um, for economies of scale, etc., technical economies, specialization economies, um, and even purchase economies, I imagine, to drive costs down um, to try and break that market. So it'll be interesting to see if one, it gets passed. Um, I can't see it being a problem with the Competition Commission. Um, because their market shares are just big not enough, really, big are enough, are they? they? So, issue, yeah. yeah, so I can't see it being a problem. I mean, it'll only be maybe corporate governance will get checked out, but I can't see that being a problem again. Um, so, yeah, I imagine that will go through in the next few months. Um, but, I mean, mergers can take can take years, can't they? So it'll be interesting to see how quickly that gets done. Um, Seeing more and more car really companies quick. sort of all kind of band together, rather, I think, and a lot of it is to try and reduce sort of duplication costs, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. and, and sort of gain access to those economies of scale. Um, I think Fiat owns Alfa Romeo. So my car comes from that yes, family. Yes, I do, yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, it will be interesting to see if it gets passed. I don't think it will, like I say, I don't think it'll be a problem because none of them are particular, none of them anywhere near market leaders. But it just goes wow. to show how, in, how difficult it is for, for businesses to get into China, isn't it? Because Chinese car sort of sales uh, the the growth in that has been unlike any other market i can really think of um the difference between sort of 1999 and 20 years later the amount of people who are there obviously massive consumer base but also increasing in wealth and the huge the huge increase in consumption of cars i know that um my year 13 when you study globalization you probably study china pretty good example to look at like how just the growth of the car market and they have a lot of businesses there that aren't necessarily in europe and not aren't necessarily in america so they've got their own competitors there as well as all the western companies that want to get in there um right okay so the next story i want to have a look at is kind of linked to the one mike's going to look at afterwards and that is i'm going to look at google and he's going to look at Domino's. but we're both kind of going to approach this from this short-term versus long-term thinking perspective and what i mean by that is businesses in the short term want to make profit and I think one tra- one trap that a lot of students fall into is they might see something about profit dropping and assume that the business isn't doing as well. And it's a bit of a bit of a misdirect, really. And it's one that we a bit, a bit of a misconception that we don't that we want to kind of explain why that's not always the case. So you might not know that Google actually has a parent company called Alphabet. And this week, their stocks have fallen by as much as 4% because they've posted a 23% decline in profit. Now, they're still making a profit, but it's less of a profit than they were making in the past. As you can see, the stock, the share price has dropped. I've just mentioned it dropped by 4%. So the immediate reaction is that this is suggestive that Google aren't doing so well. They're arguing differently. Actually, what they're saying is that their advertising revenue, which is the majority of their profit, is actually higher than it has been in the past and has beat the expectations. The reason their profits have dropped is because their costs have increased. So their perspective is that rather than think short term and think, right, how much profit have we made last year? They're thinking long term. We might sacrifice some profit now because we're going to spend things that spend money that's going to come back to us in profit in the long term. So the um, chief financial officer, Ruth Peratt, has said um, this week, As we've often discussed, we manage our business for the long term and not on a quarterly basis. We remain very focused on continuing to enhance the experience for users over the long term. So what they're effectively saying is 
they've increased their spending. So they are dominant, Google are dominant, the dominant provider of internet research to the point where the word Google has become like a verb and massive in terms of um, video services with YouTube, etc. What they've said is they've increased spending in recent years on areas such as cloud computing, so things like Google Drive, Google Documents, and stuff like that, and consumer electronics, so Google products like Google Phone, the Google Pixel, etc. They view those as essential to maintaining their position as industry leaders. Um, so what they're trying to basically say is that, yeah, okay, profits have dropped now, but in the long term, once these projects that we're spending money on now increase in profitability, as they become more developed, maybe gain more market share, we're actually going to make more profit in the long run because of it. Now, I think it's really, really useful because you see it all the time in essay questions and exam answers where a student says it's going to lead to more profit. Sometimes in the short term, profit actually has a negative impact on the long term if you're not reinvesting it effectively or you're not using it for innovation and you're not spending to try and become bigger in the future. This is a really good example of how actually Sometimes it's better to sacrifice some profit so that you can remain innovative going forward. And I think, Mike, your example um, is going to match that a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, just talk about that just for a second um, before getting onto dominoes. I think it's another important point is that students need to remember that when they're investing, a uh, business is investing, it doesn't actually hit their profits in a, in the capital sense, if that makes sense. So let's say they were to purchase a new factory, that wouldn't be the thing that would be impacting their current year's profits. Um, that would be using previous year's um, retained profits, etc. But the running costs and all the costs that go along with it, they're the things that are going to hit, hit the profit figures for that year. Um, so a lot of my students keep saying uh, maybe their profits are low this year because they've they've bought the new factory, not realizing that that's, that is something slightly different um, and that profit is for the for the year and not capital expenditure, et cetera. Um, yeah. But moving on to Domino's. Domino's, um, kind, of, kind of the opposite. I mean, Domino's are having a huge issue um, with their UK and European franchisees. Um, so, as you know, Domino's, you know, one of the most popular um, pizza pizza places on the high street, doing delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've seen grand competition um, on the high street. Um, pizza Town. Yeah, Pizza Town's one of them. Um, so, yeah, grand competition on the high street, um, but mainly from the likes of Just Eat, Uber Eat, et cetera, who have opened up the market to essentially um, get delivery from even small independent restaurants and places you'd never never thought of before. So, you know, consumer choice is starting to affect um, Domino's. Um, and with their franchise model, um, it's causing a bit, bit of a franchise um, e-revolt. So basically, um, as you'll have learned in year 12, um, if you sign up to a franchise, you will pay up a fee to, um, to have the rights to do so. You'll get all their help along with that but you'll also have to pay a royalty fee so every pound of profit you make x x percent will go to um domino's hq essentially is the franchise or um now what's happened is is while sales have gone up four percent this year um for the six months of this year um their profits have actually fallen seven percent um and that is mainly down to their the forcing on um franchisees to to do these promotions where they have to get um they have to you know two two pizzas for 20 pounds and things like that um free delivery you see all the coupons that go around um and that is essentially hurting profitability at a store level um so to drive sales to try and you know maximize sales and revenue um, that is seriously hurting profitability and you've now got to the point where um, most of the UK and European franchises are actually losing money. They're not making a profit. Um, so what they're saying now is, um, is they're now saying they want royalties dropped substantially. So the few that are barely profitable are saying this is not on. We can't. We can't be paying this. Um, they profit the so deal make a lot of dropped. it's going over to HQ. Yeah, a lot of it's going to HQ. So. Yeah, they're saying we can't afford to pay royalties, which is going to completely um, blow up the franchise model at, Dom model at Domino's. So I yeah. think it could be they end up um, taking it on the chin um, and cutting and the, the royalties, royalties. Or they I mean, might disappear. Yeah, because, I mean, it's a, it's a dangerous marketing play, isn't it, given such, such extensive deals like half-price deals or buy one, get one free on collection only or what have you. Because once a consumer gets used to paying £10 for a pizza, 
the idea of paying, I mean, I'm in that situation. I can't remember the last time I paid full price for Domino's. I don't get it unless I've got some sort of voucher um, or I'm getting it for less than sort of like a, a tenner because it's just not value. I don't perceive it as value for money. So like you can understand how a lot of consumers might, might act that way. Besides which there's so many different deals that if you order more than sort of 50 quid worth of pizza, which to be fair is only three pizzas um, because of the price of them, you get them for half price or, or what have you, whatever the deal is. So you can, de- yeah. you can definitely understand why, like why consumers would sort of change their perspective on that, can't you? Yes, I mean, Domino's have done essentially the opposite in the short-term, long-term approach. They've sacrificed uh, profits in the short term to try and maximise sales. Um, and then that's Back causing right. its own issues again. Yeah, yeah it's funny. Well, it's so you can choose both ways. So it's a balancing act um, between sales, market share, generating profit, uh, and in this case, keeping franchisees um, happy. Um, so quite an interesting little story there because everyone thinks franchising is, you know, low risk, easy. Um, and it's all, you know, a party. But um, yeah, could be interesting times ahead for Domino's. Okay, so last story for this week is about Marks and Spencers. Marks and Spencers for years have been trying to get to the younger audience, not with a huge amount of success. And this is their latest plan to do so. So they're hoping to woo young customers in the run up to Christmas by offering a buy now, pay later service. So the way this is going to work basically is you anything over 30 quid but up to i think it is up to 800 quid you can get in um interest-free installments so rather than have to pay it all up front you can pay for it over a period of six weeks and it's interest-free so you don't have to pay any more you just have to pay it off over a period of time and six weeks allows you to then maybe spread it over two paychecks or however you get if you get paid fortnightly three um this is something that a lot of businesses are doing. H&M are doing this. ASOS are doing this as well, where you can have delayed payment services. Um, you can pay for things on credit. This is a little bit different to credit in the sense that there's no interest. Um, so the business that's doing it is a company called Clearpay. So Clearpay are the, are the, sort of the, t- the company that Mark Spencer have paired up with. It is a little bit different from credit because these companies don't make money from from sort of interest they make money from earning commission on the sales transaction themselves so it's marks and spencers uh, it potentially might increase the prices a little bit to cover some of this commission but it's marks and spencers paying a cut of the revenue to clear pay rather than clear pay charging customers a little bit more in terms of interest paid so if you bought something for 100 pounds you might pay 104 in total that's not the case here whether that means that prices will end up going up a little bit so that Marks and Spencers can cover that, I don't know. I think at this point, Marks and Spencers are probably just looking to increase their revenue. Um, the reason this is sort of happening now is because they're looking at the key Christmas period and they're thinking people spend a lot of money on Christmas, especially people, young people with families or what have you. They're trying to get them to spend more of that money on Marks and Spencers. And obviously, it's quite an expensive time of year. So the ability to spread those payments over six weeks might have a big impact. So... There's a lot of retailers in the UK who already use another company called Klarna. So Klarna is a credit version of this. Um, ASOS, JD Sports, Boohoo, they all work with Klarna. Um, They say that they've got more than 3 million British customers. Clearpay only launched three months ago in the UK, but they say that they've gained more than 200,000 active customers in the first 15 weeks. So there's an example there of a trend sort of buy now, pay later being a trend. And there's an example of business growth there and they're in this market and within 15 weeks having 200,000 active customers and some reputable brands signing up. That's impressive. Um, yeah, there's a, it, and then there's a few people who aren't that keen on the idea though because they think it promotes sort of spending above your means. So Sue Anderson yeah, responsible. is from Step Change, which is a debt charity. She said that it's possible that these payment plans will encourage people to spend money they don't have. Um, presented to sort of customers as a major convenience and an opportunity to try before you buy. But there's obviously knock-on consequences of people that take on debt that otherwise they wouldn't have taken on and can't afford to have. Um, Similarly, the chief executive of Next, Simon Wolfson, he said that it's a form of credit that might be dangerous, saying there's a difference between spreading the cost and just deferring it. So they say that they've got a higher bar bar for credit products um, and they're struggling with buy now, pay later because they try and be a bit more strict on who it's offered to. Um, whereas with this clear pay stuff, you don't have any credit checks. It's on up to a maximum of £800. Pounds. It doesn't require a credit application. So there's no real check of whether the person can afford to do it. So there's a bit of an ethical argument there as well. So I thought there was a few different yeah, things there. It sounds dodgy to me. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds very dodgy. Uh, if it's not a credit agreement and it's not credit checked, how do they enforce the repayment of it? That's what I'm wondering. I've not seen this story. Um, is it a trial, do you know, Jack, or is it, a, um, is it just no, for Christmas? It says there's something going they're going to start it? offering. It doesn't say that it's a trial, so I'm assuming it's something right. they're going to start doing. Um, it's, like a, it's just effectively delayed payment, so I'm assuming that there is, although there's not... It's not a credit application. It, there probably is some sort of agreement. There is something um, you'd sign. There's something and you'd have you'd sign at the by, door if you don't pay. Yeah, but it's not like a credit <laughs> arrangement in that. With a credit arrangement, in order to, for those who don't know, in order to get credit, you'd have to fill in a sort of, effectively a credit application just proves you've got the funds to be able to pay it back. So there's yeah. nothing, where, and that would get sort of or your trust sent away. away at least. It would be yeah. sort of audited. So it would be checked whether, you, whether you're trustworthy, whether you make payments, whether you've got a decent credit rating. Um, this isn't the case like in that sense, but there will still be some sort of agreements that people have to pay it back. You it's think, not far yeah. away from a payday loan then, is it really, if it's not getting credit checked, etc.? There's no interest. Uh, yeah, yeah, true, true. That's um, the big difference between it. But it's still, yeah. ir- from an irresponsible lending point of view, um, it's an interesting one. It'll be interesting to see if they do it. Is there a, you know, when they said they're trying to aim it at, at young people, it is open to everyone though, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, that's right. just, they're, I think they're thinking, you know, the younger you generation of shoppers like to do this they don't like to pay now. They like to sort of say, right, well, I'll get it now and I'll pay for it later. Um, families with young children, obviously, it's it's just a trend. I think other companies are doing it in different ways and they just thought, right, well, we'll try and do it. If we're saying that if we're saying that our way doesn't have credit or doesn't have interest, maybe that'll give them a bit of a selling point, like a bit of a unique advantage. Um, whether it works or not, I don't know. I don't think it's going to make a difference because I don't think the, the reason young people aren't shopping at Marks and Spencers isn't because they didn't offer a credit range. <laughs> it's because... You know, you walk in there and you can see that the the products are aimed at an older audience to the one that that they're trying to target. I yeah, mean, I mean, apart from suits, I'm thirty I think and I'm not at that it, point. It? Yeah, I'm I'm thirty and I'm not at the point where I go into Marks and Spencers and think, "Ooh, that cashmere jumper is really nice." Um, <laughs> I've seen you wearing it. Yeah, that hasn't. No, <laughs> my secret is out. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But um, some of the stuff, the thing with Marks and Spencers, and this is me just giving my opinion. In no way is this like any sort of. And knock on Mark Spencer's, but I always feel like you go into the shop or you see the adverts and stuff, and it looks really good on the models. But then, you know, you see it in the store and on a hanger, and it just doesn't look quite the same. Maybe that's because I'm not a model, um, right? In an, in an attempt to try and save a possible Mark Spencer's sponsorship deal in the future, um, I've, I've got several Mark Spencer's suits, and they're not bad. But yeah, that's all suits, I'd buy from yeah, there. Yeah, that's suits. all I'd buy from there. To be fair, yeah. I mean, I think their their clothes are very good quality, but like you say, I think they are. Targeted Not a different the market. the most stylish. And their yeah. market, although there's an aging population, their market isn't, you know, my mum is 60 and she still hasn't got to the point where she's like, I'm going to stop wearing the clothes I've been wearing for the last 20 years and I'm going to, or from the shops I've been shopping at for the last 20 years. It's not like suddenly you turn a certain age and suddenly start thinking, right, really fancy trip to Marks and Spencers. <laughs> so I don't, you know, what, this might help a few people, but I don't think it's going to, help them beat the likes of ASOS or Boohoo or anyone like that. I guess the big thing is it's like zero risk essentially though, isn't it? So it's worth a pump. The, the, any extra sales they gain, they'd lose the they'd lose their commission but still make a decent amount of yeah. revenue. So. No investment um, etc really needed it for it. So why not? Right, so that ends episode four. Um, we're going to put this on the staff Facebook, the teacher sort of Facebook group, so that they can share that with you guys. Um, what I would do though is I would encourage you to, to um, subscribe on YouTube or subscribe on or follow it on on spotify or follow us on on twitter and uh, my at is at mr j goodrich mike's is at mr m sawyer um you'll be able to get sort of the podcast on there you also be able to see it when when there's updated new ones as well because the, the point of this is that it's something you go to every fortnight or so so not just jumping into one and, and listen to one a year we want it to be something that people find becomes part of their revision part of their sort of extra curricular learning um Yep, and um, I'll be making a hoot that will also be posted on the YouTube, on uh, the Facebook groups. Um, so I'll have that up ready for, for teachers to be uh, testing you on from Monday from Monday morning onwards. So have another good week uh, learning, and we'll catch you next week. See you. Thank you very much. <laughs>